guys, today we're going to do our second lab, which is our lab 1.2, the effective use of a Bunsen burner. Um, to start off, you guys need to read the pre-lab questions. Um, there's four of them. The fourth one is a hypothesis. Remember for the hypothesis, you're going to say if, then, and because. So if I set the wire gauze at this position, then it will be the most effective position because, and we'll talk about that a little more as we get into the discussion right now. So again, our problem is to investigate where is the proper placement on a Bunsen burner to get the very best, most effective heat. And we're gonna be looking at different positions on that Bunsen burner. The way we're testing this is we're gonna use four beakers of water, the same amount of water, the same temperature of water, so that we can test and see based on the position only, not the temperature of the water, not the amount of water, based on that position above the flame, which one would take the less time to boil? Because if it takes less time to boil, then it's obviously going to be the best, right? Uh, position for the most effective heating. All right, so you guys are going to read the paragraph at the very top. Go ahead and look over the materials. You are responsible for knowing what these materials are. I'll explain it during the lab as I do it for you guys. Um, this is going to be a, a short version of the lab. I will give you guys some data to work with from some of the classes, um, but I did want to take the time to explain it to you separately so that if you guys have questions on the exam over unit one that refer back to the lab, you at least have had me direct teaching and you understand and know what's expected of you as far as that test goes, okay? So basically the first thing we're gonna do is, like I said, the pre-lab questions. Um, you guys have access to the lab. It is in your, um, it's in your assignment on Canvas and it's lab 1.2. So you click on the PDF of the lab manual and just scroll down until you see lab 1.2. It's called the effective use of a Bunsen burner. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we've got four beakers. We're gonna label them one, two, three, and four. So normally on a beaker, you guys would have a grease pencil. Uh, the grease pencil allows us to make markings on glassware and it comes off rather easy. So the first thing you'll do is you'll label these one, two, three, and four, and then we are ready to go ahead and move on to procedure number two. Procedure number two says, that we are going to set up a ring stand and attach the ring to the stand. I've already done that here, so that is step number two. The next thing it says is we are going to use a graduated cylinder and measure out 100 milliliters of distilled water into beaker one. So what you guys will notice is that I've already filled up beakers two, three, and four. I wanna remind you that when we are using these graduated cylinders, this right here is to keep it from breaking or shattering if it falls over. You do not put this at the 100 mark and then pour. So lift it all the way up so you can clearly see the 100 mark. The 100 sets on the 100 mark. So look at where it's sitting. And remember also with our graduated cylinders, they're a more accurate measurement of volume than a beaker because even though these have a 100 mark, it doesn't have a lot of marks, so it's not as exact. So beakers are used for holding materials. We saw in the first lab, they held sand and salt. In this lab, they're holding water. But our graduated cylinder is what is the best piece of equipment for measuring volume accurately because it has way more of those measuring marks, okay? And then we're gonna use our distilled water and we're gonna bring it exactly to the 100 milliliter mark. Now remember when you're dealing with volume, Water, because of its properties of cohesion and adhesion, is going to create like a little dip. We call that a meniscus. And basically, we are going to read at the bottom of the meniscus. So as the meniscus curves up to the top, you would not want to read the volume from the top of the meniscus. You would want to read the volume from the bottom. So you would get down eye height. And again, using the distilled water, add until the very bottom of the meniscus is going to be right at that 100 milliliter mark. And then you're going to carefully transfer it or pour it into your beakers. All right, at this time, um, we've got the ring stand and the ring set up. We have a piece of wire gauze with a ceramic or asbestos center. What that does is it spreads the heat out. 
So in other words, instead of having a very pointed um, acute area where the heat is on the beaker, this little gauze and the asbestos or ceramic middle is gonna spread that heat out so that the entire beaker is evenly heated. Um, that's a wire gauze. And basically that gauze also is a nice flat platform so that we can place our beaker on top of, okay? All right, so the next thing that we're gonna do is we are gonna make sure that our Bunsen burner is attached correctly to the gas jet. You also wanna inspect it to make sure that there are no holes or tears in the tubing because then you would get a gas leak. Um, you also want to know that as these gas jets are facing perpendicular from the actual jet, so the handle is facing perpendicular from the jet, that's off. When the handle is facing parallel, that is gonna be on. So right now you guys can see that my gas, jet, my gas jets are turned off. Okay, at this time, we are going to now light the Bunsen burner. So the first thing that we do, I'm gonna put on my safety goggles. Um, the first thing that we're gonna do is for a Bunsen burner with a striker, you're always going to turn the gas on first and then strike it. I always like you guys to do it outside of the actual ring stand so that you can control um, the flame, you can make it larger or smaller, and I'll show you what a good flame looks like and what a good flame does not look like. All right, so we're gonna turn the gas on and you're gonna use your striker. And apparently my striker is, there it goes. My gas is very, very low right here. I don't know if you guys can see, but there is a blue flame here. And you can use this very bottom paddle to adjust the height of your flame. You wanna make sure that you've got a inner and an outer blue cone. The next thing that we're gonna do is adjust this part here so can you guys see how that's a yellow flame? That is a good campfire flame, but not a good chemistry flame. It has too much, uh, it has not enough oxygen in it. So as we turn this part of the Bunsen burner, we remove, um, and now we have more of a chemistry flame. So as long as you can see the inner and the outer blue cone, then you are good to go. All right, so basically when it's, lit, we are adjusting the gas flow and the oxygen flow. So the flame is blue with an inner light blue cone. So I'm going to pause the video real quick and turn the lights out so you guys can see the inner and outer blue cone uh, pretty well. Actually, I'm not because I'm afraid if I pause the video, it will delete. Okay, so basically, I hope you guys can see the inner and outer blue cone. If you cannot, in the lab manual, you'll see a black and white picture that's basically what that looks like. Okay, at this point, it says that after you adjust the flame, move the burner to the ring stand and observe the height of the wire gauze. So at this point, the wire gauze is nowhere near any of the height positions, one, two, three, that we are looking for. It's probably more like in the position of height four, okay? So the hypothesis is, where do you think, based on the drawing figure A in your lab manual, would be the hottest part of the flame. So again, here's kind of what it would look like. Test height number one would be the wire gauze down here. This would be somewhere in the bottom portion of the inner blue cone. The second test height would be about right here, the actual tip of the inner blue cone. The third test height would be the tip of the outer blue cone. And the fourth test height would be even higher where you are not touching the outer blue cone. So at this time, go ahead and hypothesize which one you think would produce the most effective heat, and I want you to explain why. So when you write your hypothesis, you say, if we position the flame to test height one, if that's what you think, then it would be the most effective flame or it would produce the most heat because, and then tell me why. So when you make a hypothesis, you wanna use the if, then, and because wording, and you also want to draw on your prior experiences. So think about if you're gonna choose this height way down here, closest to the Bunsen burner itself, why do you think that is gonna produce the most heat? Or if you think it's this one, 
why is that position going to produce the most heat? So you want to make sure that your hypothesis has some evidence or some observation that you're bringing in to support your claim. Hypothesis is just our educated guess. All right, so the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to adjust our flame and we're going to do it um, at the test height number one. So that would be right here. And I would scooch my iron uh, ring closer so that my Bunsen burner is directly under the wire gauze for test height one. And then we're gonna go ahead and turn off the gas. So what we'll do now is we wanna kind of measure um, the distance because that's what we're trying to achieve is the distance. So I'm gonna pull my Bunsen burner out a little bit and I'm gonna use a ruler and I'm gonna measure the distance in centimeters for test type one. And I want you guys to write down that two centimeters in your data table is going to be the test height number one. So we're in data table two, and we're gonna put that test height number one is gonna be two centimeters. All right, when we get to the lab, we'll go ahead and uh, do how long it takes to boil, okay? So two centimeters, and you're gonna repeat that for test type three and test type four. Um, so test type one is two centimeters. I'm gonna give you guys the data after our class does it, and you'll use the data that I send as a photo to go ahead and justify your results. So that's test type number one at two centimeters. Before we start the experiment and actually do the boiling, we wanna make sure that we have the same temperature in all beakers. So you guys can see this is my temperature probe. Right now it is 22.4 degrees Celsius. I would set the temperature probe into each of my waters and let it kind of acclimate. So this one says it's 21.9.8. So give it a few minutes to kind of acclimate. And after it does acclimate, you're gonna to want to record the temperature. So again, this one is gonna be 22.7. And then you'll check the next beaker to make sure it also is 21.7. And then the next one, 21.7. And the next one, 21.7. So as I did it, it kind of dropped and actually my final is between 21.5 and 21.7. Um, but basically we're gonna record that it is the same in all four beakers. So if you guys wanna go ahead and put 21.5, that was the final cooling temperature of all four waters, 21.5. So on your data table here, number one, the starting temperature of the water for all four beakers was 21.5. Make sure you put your unit degrees Celsius. Okay, the next thing that we're gonna do is we've already got our test height ready to go and we are going to then begin doing the actual experiment. So again, notice that I turned the Bunsen burner off after getting the test height set up because we don't wanna have the burner on as I am moving around the area. We only wanna have it on when it's time to actually do the boiling of the water. So we're gonna pull the Bunsen burner back. Remember how we lit it again? You're gonna open up the gas jet parallel, light it, and then you're gonna to want to move it underneath the Bunsen burner ring stand. All right, now we're ready to take our beaker number one that we labeled, and we have to have a timer. So we're gonna have a timer, a cell phone, or you can use a watch timer, and we're gonna record how long it takes this first one to boil. So I'm gonna go ahead and set it here, and we're gonna let that thing boil for a little bit, and I am then going to, after it boils, stop and let you guys know, again, in our data that I send you as a picture, um, the time that it took for this first one to boil. Now, we're gonna repeat this for all four beakers of water. Okay, so we're basically trying to see how long in seconds each placement of that ring is going to take and whatever takes the least amount of time is going to be the most effective flame. So at this point, we are waiting for boil. Um, you wanna make sure that again, you've got constants in the experiment. That means you've got things that are not changing only one thing that can change, and that's gonna be the height of that wire gauze. So we had the same amount of water, 100 milliliters. We had the same temperature of the water, 21.5 degrees Celsius. And it's very important to call boiling 
at the same visual description. So you guys know what spaghetti looks like when it boils. It's like blah, 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 big boils, right? That is one way to say boil. Another way to call boil is when you see little bitty bubbles starting to form and move up. So you and your team are gonna have to decide what are we calling boil? Is it a rapid boil or is it gonna be the baby bubbles that begin shooting up from the bottom of the beaker? I think it's probably best to call the roaring boil the one that's gonna be the big bubbles so that it is very, very clear that you're calling the same boil so that we don't have more than one variable that we're testing. So we're gonna be waiting for this to boil as I continue with the lab and explain. So basically test type one will get a time in seconds for it to boil and you guys would record that in data table number one. All right, then you'll move on to the second test type. Now this is not boiling yet, but for time purposes, I'm gonna go ahead and shut it off and explain to you how we need to move it and change our test type. And then I'll give you the data and you can complete the lab. So again, once you reach the boil, you would turn the gas jet back perpendicular and now know that because that was boiling this beaker is very very hot there's two things you can do one of them use beaker tongs to grab your beaker hold it very carefully and tightly and set it down on the lab bench or you could have gotten the hot mitts and used those to remove the beaker now the hot mitts are going to be used here as i reposition my flame now so in between our heatings we have our Bunsen burner turned off so that we can reposition. But look, this is iron, so it's gonna be very hot. I'm going to first light the Bunsen burner so that I can position this and you guys can see now test height number two and measure the centimeters of test height two. So I'm gonna light my Bunsen burner. And remember that test height two was the wire gauze, not the iron, and it needs to be at the tip of the inner blue cone. So this, would, for example, be a good test height number two. It's at the tip of that inner blue cone. So I'm gonna turn my gas jet back perpendicular, turning it off. I'm gonna kind of slide this over, use my centimeters again to measure the space. So test height two is 5.1 centimeters. So again, in our data table, test height two would be 5.1 centimeters. All right. While we are at it, we'll go ahead and at this point, um, put our next beaker of water on top of the Bunsen burner and we will start our timer. At that point, you will get a time that it took our second beaker with our second test height to boil. We'll repeat that for the third and for the fourth. And when you guys get your data, you'll find that which one of these takes the least amount of time to boil would be the most effective area to place the gauze in order to get the most effective flame. And that is our Bunsen burner lab. Don't forget, after I send you guys the, um, the data table that has the information for the different test heights and the time that it took to boil, um, that basically you guys are responsible for the analyzing and concluding questions here and also on the back and the real world chemistry. You do not have to write the question, just the answer in a complete sentence. So again, lab 1.1 and 1.2 are gonna be due as one PDF document. It needs to be submitted to Canvas by the deadline. And again, one PDF for both labs. Hope you guys enjoyed it.